then by Rashmi Dovan Swami. The third one was by Vidhi Pradgankar. And today we have the fourth one by Gurvinda Singh. He's, of course, the youngest of the lot. And he was just telling me that he had never delivered a lecture before. So that's going to be his debut in lecturing, which he will have to resort to quite often if he had to remain in the world of cinema. And I hope he does remain there. Uh, he is one of our most uh, talented figures to emerge recently in the world of cinema. And what is more important is that he earned his acclaim by two films in Punjabi, uh, which must be quite a rare uh, phenomena in terms of, uh, one never took Punjabi uh, as a language of cinema in, in the, in the uh, broad sense of the term. And, uh, well, there's hardly a festival in which his films have not been shown in Khan, in, uh, oh, where is the list? In Venice, in Museum of Modern Art, New York, in Abu Dhabi Film Festival, the best film at the International Film Festival of India, Goa, won national awards, including National Film Award for Best Direction, and National Film Award for Best Cinematography, Golden Lotus Award, etc. He has won a large number of awards and wide acclaim. And his first, I mean, his, uh, the, the Ande Kode Dadan was. Uh, shown in a certain regard in Khan, uh, or the other one. Because I remember Mani calls Satesh Rukta Admi was shown uh, in the same uh, section of the uh, Khan Film Festival. Um, he has been a student of, of FEII, which has been in news for all the wrong reasons uh, some months ago. And he had just come from there where he was teaching. His connection with Mani Kaur goes back, uh, apart from the fact that he must have known him personally and may maybe he taught him. When Mani Kaur was teaching a course in the institute, he had requested uh, Gurvinder Singh to be his teaching assistant. And that later, Gurvinder Singh had translated Udayan Vajpayee's long conversation with Mani Kaur into English, uh, which has been published as Unclub Global Space. Uh, as you see, his lecture is called Between the Two Wings, a reflection on comprehension and practice. So may I request Gurvinda Singh, would you speak from there or from here? Oh, there you are. <laughs>
not just uh, talking about cinema, but you know, like <laughs> we spent a lot of time cooking <laughs> together. And uh, once I remember, uh, Maniji, uh, he called me and we were like discussing some recipe over the phone. He said, yeah, we are talking about granny. <laughs> So, yeah, but you know, there was no uh, distinction between, you know, the, uh, uh, between a uh, uh, formal learning space or an informal learning space with him. Every moment could become a revelation and, uh, uh, yeah, and a moment to remember which one would extend and recollect even while making films or say while painting as I did sometimes. Uh, his most famous anecdote was of course about the salt. That uh, you don't put salt at one go in the food while you're cooking. So you first you put a little, then a little more, and then one second. So three times you have to put the salt to get it right. <laughs> and uh, that he would extend to many things, you know. <laughs> But yes, so, but of course, I will uh, speak a little about him because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I am indebted to him in many ways. Uh, so, yeah, so I will start. I have written something. I'm not an academic or a scholar who is comfortable with a desk, symposiums, or lecture rooms. I'd rather be where you are right now and not behind this podium. Sometimes I find it, find it incapable to think in words or put ideas into words. Hence, when asked to give a lecture, I first confront my own limitations with the medium of words. Ideas or events need a structure to be espoused or made visible. My comfort space is a space of images and sounds, not words. And creating those images is perhaps a way of thinking I'm more comfortable and familiar with. It's the space I enjoy and travel in with a childlike enthusiasm. I had once asked Mani, forever intrigued, intrigued with his energy and desire to learn and express, how did he find it possible to go through the arduous process of making films after films? which he did with a relentless vigor, almost against all odds. Did not the process of shooting film after film exhaust him when he was making films with the regularity and intensity he was? I, of course, was trying to figure out the limitations of my own bodily slumber and whether I had it in me to go through this physically and mentally tasking process. Very calmly he reflected on the question, as he always did, and said, he would sleepwalk through all those shoots. Sleepwalking, to be in the state of sleep and waking at the same time. I recollect, I recollected the American composer John Cage's remark, being home is that feeling of oneness with oneself. That was what perhaps money meant. He could turn that space, or any space for that matter, into a homely space. Being home, Home being who you are, or knowing. Home being who you are, or knowing who you are. Shooting meant for him being at home, whether they were the ghats of Benares or a frozen lake in Ladakh, or be it Altamont Road or Versova in Bombay. I realized being at home was perhaps the only route for any artist, even so more for a filmmaker who has to confront the often hostile world of raising finance and engaging distribution. This hostility perhaps did not end with just that, and extended into the world of reception, replete with a lack of perception or sympathy towards certain forms of expressions not in sync with mass and mechanically produced forms. Did one want to go down that path? Did I want to go down that path? Was the making at all a medium for me, for someone who felt inhibited to even share with others what he was practicing? Wasn't it just enough to make something and let it be hidden in some corner, away from public gaze, 
resting undisturbed, gathering time, and with it perhaps meaning or meaninglessness. Artistic activity was a secret code to be practiced in solitary confines of one's loneliness. The practice of it was the more essential part than the sharing. Sharing was perceived as a commercial encounter which I was reluctant to navigate, still do to some extent. <clears throat> Cinema started at an early age, unconsciously, and of which I have no record, only memory. And yes, it did start as a moving image, but without a moving camera. No longer in use, an old twin reflex camera light neglected around the house. Unlike today's digital cameras, it was an easy piece to fling open and look inside its innards, fingering and dissecting every part. The ground glass, the mirror, the lens, the plastic spool on which the film rotated. And when the camera was held close to a wall with its back open, it threw magical color images on the wall of what the lens was facing. Whereas all the pictures taken by it until then by my father were just monochromatic, deep blacks and pristine whites on bromide paper. What I now saw, saw were rich hues of greens of the eucalyptus trees outside, its branches swaying gently in the afternoon breeze in this tiny square image on the wall. It was a miracle to see the white world outside encapsulated in this little square on the wall and all in color. And there it was forever as long as you held the camera close to the wall. No pressing of any button or loading or developing any film, it didn't cost anything. You could point it in any direction and have a condensed, crisp, clear image on the wall. If something moved in front of the lens, it moved in the image too. And if the lens was rotated, it threw the image into a blurry fuzziness, turning the real world into abstract packets of colors. And rotated back, the abstraction miraculously returned to the recognizable world. It left me perplexed how a camera which only took frozen black and white images on paper could create these alive forms, both abstract and coherent, and that too in color. Now, when I look back, I realize I was discovering the science behind the making of photographic images, my own camera obscura. But more importantly, in one stroke, Wondering at the relationship between the real and the abstract, the formed and the formless, the reality and its perception. Did the human mind eye also see like the camera was seeing? The human eye had no clear edges, whereas photographs, paintings, cinema halls, television, all had clear edges where the image ended. Everything was confined in a rectangle or a square seldom in an oval or a circle. Whereas what the eye saw faded into blurriness at the corners. But one could always move the eyeballs or turn the head into any direction to extend one's vision. The world of images was always cut off at the edges. Where to cut it off became the fundamental question and a singular obsession. I started scanning through magazines and newspapers and kept fervently cutting and collecting whatever caught my fancy. <coughs> The printed world of images was more seductive than the real world one was growing up in. Reproductions of paintings, photographs, faces, advertisements, typo typography, all neatly tucked into notebooks or pasted on sheets of paper. Unrelated things all juxtaposed with no apparent connections between those images and words. And with no desire to arrive at a narrative or meaning, but still feeling a connection between those which I could not explain, but only feel. Feelings seemed more intoxicating than the rationality of meaning and explanation, which is what education and learning in curriculum was all about. Seeing through a camera's lens and gathering these unrelated images became an act of rebellion against the rigid and confined methodology of having to forcefully memorize things one was not interested in, but forced fed with. The classroom became a draconian space which left one famished and hungry for other experiences. Whereas there was a freedom in looking, hearing, observing, feeling, capturing, expressing, wandering in aimless pursuits, <clears throat> and tracing the outlines of contours of an old man with deep melancholic eyes, which many years later I realized was the self-portrait of the artist Rembrandt. 
or of two women in a quiet pose staring into nothingness, or of chairs and sunflowers in a vase, or of apples against a jug. There was something alive in these traces which was a better understanding of their forms than in reality. Their representation had a feeling and emotion that perhaps solid objects in real life lacked. You could keep looking into those eyes and feel they were looking at you too, and then create an imaginary dialogue with the old man. To see, to feel, and to represent and create seemed a valid and worthy enough activity for the humankind to pursue. To make sense of one's existence in the world of shapes, sounds, textures, arrangement, colors, forms, both moving and inanimate. <clears throat> the world of the frozen image had become such an obsession that years later at the film school in Pune, when watching films, I could only see a series of compositions, lines, vertical, horizontal or diagonal, the flipping forms of lights and shadows, and faces talking to each other. I was so lost in that maze of shapes and arrangements now revealed in a series of images moving across spaces that I would never involve myself in the narrative of the story. The film would end and I would only wonder at how the world was represented, how the faces were lit, how shadows fell in the rooms or on the streets, of how the camera followed the people, how someone was angry, happy, sad, or how people fought or made love. I was happy to be lost in those impressions never caring to follow the count of events, which everyone was so keen to fathom and unravel. I would often be so moved by a film or feel so agonized and restless about the state of human existence as depicted, but if someone were to ask me the story of the film, I won't be able to describe anything because I had never cared to follow it. Concept, ideas, theories, I would view with suspicion. Plots, situations, psychological impulses, discussed in classroom made me wary. That could not be the reason why a film would be made. The burden of meaning seemed to distill what was mysterious and magical about those films, reducing it to explanatory notes. The unfathomable fathomable had a depth in which I also seemed to be swimming, rather than simply understanding. And that seemed to be the only valid experience one could gather from a film. The streets of Pune offered an escape from the onus of expectations and the daily confrontations with virtuos virtuosos of cinematic history. To lose oneself in one's own backyard was perhaps as important as navigating the streets of Tokyo or Paris. It was time to rediscover that reflection on the wall of which I had no record to show, but vividly remembered. The smell of rains, marigolds, jasmine and tulsi, incense sticks in corridors of buildings, the women with big red tilaks, the sleek golden sari borders and checkered weaves, the men in white pajamas and white caps, the languorous tea stalls and temples with black idols of Vithoba and Rukmini. This was the present, the here and now. A river of humanity had descended in the month of Ashar, all chanting and jumping in joy and the monsoon drizzled to the rhythm of cymbals and drums. The river led to Dehu, Alandi, Pandapur, where solitary men in guard strolled with a veena in hand in the prayer halls, reciting the abhangs of Gyaneshwar, Tukaram, Namdev. The recitation never paused. The vigil never ceased, even if men standing on one leg. The poetry of Arun Kolapkar took us on to the stone steps of Jejuri, marveling at the scattered sea of turmeric and overflowing oil in lamps blackened with years of soot. And further up north were the wondrous caves of Ajanta, lined with tales of the Jatakas, murals of Aspara, Apsaras, kings, queens, courtesans, dancers, all bedecked in fine costumes and jewels, some of which had withstood the ravages of time. And the giant sleeping Buddha, whose stone sculpted body had been smoothened out over centuries by the millions of hands that would have ran over him. Life extended beyond the confines of edges. The past and present collided. How to bring together the unending flow of time together became the predicament. <coughs> I 
locked myself up all night in the dark room of the institute, immersed in the smell of photochemicals and film, and the magical transformation of a white sheet into rich tones of blacks and grays. Gone was the wall that did not recall anything. The feeling of ephemerality and loss gave way to a sense of empowerment and possession. The images stayed and were recorded, literally fixed by a chemical. As Susan Sontag wrote in her seminal essay on photography, to photograph is to appropriate the thing photographed. It means putting oneself into a certain relation to the world that feels like knowledge and therefore like power. One felt one was in possession of this external reality, captured through a lens or a fragment of a second. But did it add up to something significant in terms of experience or understanding of events and emotions? What was the miss that one wondered so much about after watching, say, a film by Andrei Tarkovsky or Yashiro Ozu or Robert Bresson? Susan Sontag further goes to add, photographed images do not seem to be statements about the world so much as pieces of it, miniatures of reality that anyone can make or acquire. She says, a photograph is both a pseudo-presence and a token of absence. If a photograph was a pseudo-presence, then what was cinema? And what went absent from this presence of a split moment on paper? All the nights dodging and burning images onto bromide paper and dipping fingers into photochemicals instead of solving anything, only complicated things. Beautiful compositions and striking visual forms started seeming restricting. How long could one look at a distinctive face or admire the frozen blades of grass rendered as authentically as possible in its tonalities? Picasso's broken and fragmented forms and even Matisse's child-like paper cuts seemed more arresting and mysterious. I felt cinema was as simple as joining moving photographs, if one could call the unit of shot as a moving photograph. At that time, it did seem that simple. At that time, it did seem that simple, as if all one needed was an arresting frame after another. The complex polyphony of images, sounds, and words was not as easy as putting together a few scraps of images and letting them be. To quote Susan Sontag again, the camera's rendering of reality must always hide more than it discloses in contrast to the amorous relation, which is based on how something looks. Understanding is based on how it functions. And functioning takes place in time and must be explained in time. Only that which narrates can make us understand. Now I'm more than ever reminded of the tiny representation of eucalyptus trees swaying on the walls and realize that the moment they moved, they pulled in time. That was so thrilling about the movement from static trees. Hence the memory of them seems more vital and alive than anything I ever exposed on those bromide sheets. What seemed transitory and illusion, illusionary has left an indelible impression, and what seemed permanent and formed has faded in memory, as if things once fixed lose their significance. I came across the work of the British artist David Hockney. <clears throat> Heightened intensities and extremely saturated paintings of everyday life, swimming pools, neighborhood streets, tree-lined avenues, portraits of friends and family. But what caught my attention was a series of photography, which he called joiners. These were mostly Polaroid photographs the in-vogue instant photography format in the 1980s. The print was developed in the camera. Not content with a single image, Hockney would take a series of photographs moving across his subject and then join them 
in a sequence on a board. So he had fragmented parts adding to a whole, but not as a whole as we understand of a single moment, but many moments pulled in together, creating an experience of memory. Hockney said, I want you to put time into the photograph more obviously than just in the evidence that my hand pressed the shutter and there it was. Those series could be seen in parts and experienced as a whole from a distance. You are drawn in to examine every part, which sometimes is nothing more than just a corner of a chair or a piece of ground or just a fragment of the face or hands. There is a movement going on which keeps changing and leads to a differential viewing each time. The combinations of pictures have much greater possibilities than looking at a single image of the same subject. It represented a complete reversal of the usual qualities and utility of photography. According to Hockney, any drawing or painting contains time because you know it took time to do. You know it wasn't made with a glance. If it's honest work, you know it must be a genuine scrutiny of the experience of seeing. He says, one, extra, one extraordinary thing I discovered was that you can go on and on looking at good paintings, which is very unusual with photographs. However good the photograph, it doesn't haunt you in the way that a painting can. A good painting has real ambiguities, which you never get to grips with. And that's what is so tantalizing. You keep looking back. A single light photograph can't have that quality. What primarily Hockney was doing was extending space with movement and bringing in the dimension of time and memory into those joiners. And it has dominated Western art for about 400 years since the invention of the camera obscura. Many artists like Canaletto and Vermeer used the camera obscura and naturally they were fascinated by its possibilities. With the invention of the camera obscura, easel painting flourished. Previously, the idea of painting was always on much bigger areas, such as walls or ceilings, and the edges were far away. Painting was not about edges and corners. But with this idea of the window, the camera leads inevitably to an interest in a very similitude. By the 19th century, a lot of artists realized there was something wrong with this. It was not quite truthful. And in Europe, certain artists noticed, <coughs> certain artists started to escape from the one point perspective of Western art when they noticed Oriental art and Japanese art in particular. The Japanese and the Chinese did not have the camera until the 19th century. One assumes they did, because there's no evidence of their art being one eyed Renaissance artists were always looking with one eye, looking through a hole. Oriental artists had different ideas. They could depict the landscape as a scroll which opens out. While a Chinese artist would paint his experience of the walk in the garden, the Western artists became content with looking at the garden through the window. His experience became stationary. Manet and Van Gogh saw some Japanese prints which must have looked unbelievable to them in the 19th century. Here was an art that dealt with essences, not with very similitude, which is about surfaces. They were fascinated at influence and it influenced them. Manet's forms became simpler and bolder. They accused of Manet of being like a child, which is just what they called Picasso. Hockney says, I realized that with this photography, that is of his joiners, I was making things closer to the truth of the way we see them. We see everything in focus, but we don't see it all at once. We take time. I could not but think back to the bureaus of Ajanta, of a free-flowing art creating narrative, dialogue, dimensions in space and time, or of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, and the scroll painters of Orissa, Bengal, and Rajasthan, who know no edges. <coughs> if a conventional Western perspective freezes a moment, it must surely stop the flow of time. The trouble with perspective is that it has no movement at all. 
the one vanishing point exists only for a fresh fraction of seconds to us. The moment your eye moves, it's gone, and it's somewhere else. In a painting, the hand is moving, the mark is being made, these things themselves run through time. Why is that people are always interested and impressed by what they call handmade work? The camera is only a machine, but a drawing made by a human machine fascinates them much more than anything photographic. It's an interesting fact that the perspective in painting matters less than it does in the photograph, which by nature of the lens is forced to have perspective. The Renaissance idea of fixing space persists. Posing for a photograph is a Renaissance idea. When you pose for a photograph, you stop, and you imitate the stop time. According to Hockney, and I quote, the experience of art is more real in painting than in photography. The moment is longer, and we can feel that moment. In a photograph, we can't. Perhaps this is why there are so few good photographs. The good ones that do exist are almost accidental. One fraction of a second, that looks as though it's longer than it is. We don't know what an isolated fraction of a second is. We can't isolate a second in our lives, can we? The photograph must be a much more primitive picture than a painting is. But if you ask the average person which looks more real, they would say, obviously, the photograph. Perspective is a theoretical abstraction that was worked out in the 15th century. It suddenly altered pictures. It gave a strong illusion of depth. It lost something and gained something. At first, the gain was thrilling. But slowly, very slowly, we became aware of what had been lost. That loss was the depiction of passing of time. We thought this way of looking was so true, true, that when the photograph came along, it seemed to confirm perspective. It was exactly the same way of looking from one central point with one eye fixed in time. We know the perspective is not real. We know the lines don't meet. We know that if you move along them, all is parallel. The photograph belongs to the Renaissance picture. Essentially, we are still a spectator outside. <clears throat> One day I received an email from Mani. This was the year 2005. He had decided to visit the Film Institute in Pune to conduct a workshop. He asked if I would be his teaching assistant. Of course, I didn't have to blink an eye before deciding. And I know that at the pretext of the post of a teaching assistant, Mani was inviting me to be a student. Unlike other filmmaker teachers, teachers, Mani would never talk about his films. If asked a question about his work in the class, he would deflect it to a larger philosophical question about space, movement, representation, nature of things, memory, and more significantly, towards duration, attention, and time. Space was negotiable. A lot of us understood the implications of moving in space, but we grappled with the moment in time. For the first time, while discussing filmmaking, things moved away from visual, visual representation to unfolding of time as a central idea the very material of filmmaking. A horizontal narrative impacted by a vertical narrative of time and memory and attention, where at every moment, through a polyphonic structure, several images and words and sounds, which always don't go in the same direction, don't have to, are at play. Whereas until then, it was the issue of having a fact and then another, in relationship, in relation to cause and effect. With the film, unless you constantly freeze the projection, there's a complex polyphony coming at you at every moment, without all the connections being immediately decipherable, because it runs in time. It's a form of time. Photograph is a form of space. People nowadays don't know how to see a photo without trying to interpret them. There has to be a key either comprehensive or explanatory. 
the effect of mass media that constantly designates nothing is ever shown unless it is claimed to have been defined already. Reality has been reduced to the shifting, ephemeral, anti-poetic, explainable, and meaningless artificiality of facts and documents, photographically reproducible and transmissible by the mass market press and information industry. Technical reproduction joined with information. As Godard said, modernity being the tendency to reduce everything to the present, to the observable, and reproducible to what appears in front of or is determined by the camera, and modern art by contrast, embodying resistance to this reductive tendency by attempting to liberate its utopian virtualities. Cinema, situated at the meeting point of these two possibilities, ought to be the most important thing in contemporary art. Money had this unique ability to clarify things one was grappling with, with a small answer, never more than four or five words. I mean, money is known to give long lectures, but when it came to clarifying what one was grappling with, you never received the lecture, you only got a small capsule. We all knew of the visual impact of his films and the often impressive cinematography. Restless and having grappled with and sometimes failed with striking visual compositions, which I knew came very easily and confidently to me. I wish to know how he composed his shots. So I asked Mani, Mani, how do you decide how to compose? He reflected over the question for a few seconds and then said, I compose for light. Light. And then I wondered how come one has never thought of light while composing? <laughs> Why has it always been about lines and perspective and shapes and volumes and planes? That small answer fundamentally changed my way of looking through the camera. How light fell on objects and people and spaces became the overriding concern. Suddenly, composition became the least important thing to worry about. I became aware that attention was drawn by the quality of light in which composition had a very small role to play. And that attention created a certain feeling and emotion in the shot. And that feeling and emotion gave a direct experience of passage of time, of life in itself. As Kandinsky remarked about Cezanne, Cezanne made a living thing out of a teacup, or rather in a teacup, he realized the existence of something alive. He raised the life to such a point that it ceased to be inanimate. He painted these things as he painted human beings, because he was endowed with the gift of divining the inner life in everything. The light, I realized, was the inner life of things, the divine being. The other significant realization that made possible an, an affirmation of time concerns sound, which knew no edges or borders of the frame. The sound extended beyond the camera's eye, beyond the confines of the rectangle on the screen, like the mural or scroll artist extended the narrative beyond the periphery into a continuous and stretched idea of space and time. The less I relied on images for information, and the more that role was taken over by sound, the images started becoming more robust and animated, bereft of the necessary desire to legislate. The images had to be stripped of the burden to carry the meaning, so they could express freely. That burden had to be relayed to sound, which was a better carrier of all things associated and remembered. And it created the world around extended into the echo of depths which no visual image could reach. The visual had lost another of its functions. It became, as e it became at ease with itself and could breathe. As Robert Bressor remarked, like an athlete passing on the baton in a relay. Those few days spent in Pune with him were so instrumental in and consciously or subconsciously discarding notions and conventions that one banded around like excess, excess baggage on a flight. 
The answers came with time. The dualities of the relevant and the irrelevant, the significant and the insignificant, meaning and meaninglessness, the right and wrong, the sacred and the profane, were mere conventions which had no relationship with the inner necessity to express and communicate. My thoughts go back to 2010 as another period of dismay with the expectations of the medium of cinema cast dark clouds over one's impulses and desires. Unwilling to negotiate the space of raising finances, doubts plagued me over the ability and willingness to pursue filmmaking. I had to have one last dialogue with money before rejecting, which I forever was willing to ever since the days in Pune. Very patiently he listened to me over the phone as I narrated my anguish with the practicalities of the medium and my confusion and incertitude to carry on thinking about cinema without having to practice it the way one would wish to. I felt like giving up, I exclaimed. Taking a deep, deep breath, he, he acknowledged my predicament in his customary style with a stretched, hmm, then said, knowledge and practice are like two wings of a bird. One needn't probe any further. There was no duality here. They had to be treated as one. What prodded the other was an irrelevant question. They took flight together. <coughs> Money got left us five years ago as I was editing my first feature film, Anne Gode Dadan. He had taken a keen interest in its making and I acknowledge that it would not have been possible to raise funds for it without his assistance. He invited me and my editor over to his house in Gurgaon, where he breathed his last. Till his last breath, he wanted to oversee how the film was shaping, though his health did not allow him to even sit or look into a computer screen for long. He asked us to edit in the adjacent room, and we would ask and, and would ask us to keep the volume loud so he could hear the sounds of the film as we edited. After we had edited the opening sequence of the film, he asked us to bring it over for him to see. But see, he did not. He told us he was not interested in the images. He only wanted to hear the sounds we had edited. So we closed the image track and played the edit timeline. When the seven minutes of the opening sequence ended, he exclaimed, wow. He said it's very moving and musical, but only one sound seemed out of rhythm for him. And that was the dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> he said we should remove that dialogue and not worry about the visual cut. Or about the story. <laughs> if the cut was right, the image would find its own correct, if the sound cut was right, the image would find its own correct place and relationship in respect to other images. Here was a man who was challenging the very notion and convention of a visual cut, even as he breathed his last. At this stage, I would like to recall Kandinsky, who in his book, Concerning the Spiritual in Art, wrote, the artist must be blind to distinctions between recognized or unrecognized conventions of form deaf to the transitory teaching and demands of his particular age. He must watch only the trend of the inner need and hearken to its words alone. Then he will with safety employ means both sanctioned and forbidden by his contemporaries. All means are sacred, which are called for by the inner need. All means are sinful, which obscure that inner need. After those last few days spent with him, as I left with a heavy heart, knowing perhaps it was the final adieu, I received an email a few days later. Money had written, I do hope your editor is doing a blind sound cut and not compromising the rhythm of the soundtrack by each time checking the visual result. That is, looking at the image track and attempting a balance between image and sound. Once the image gets into the so-called correct action cut mold, the cinematograph is finished. At least a direct expression of time is dead. 
In the realm of, in the realm of employing time as a favorite tool, the space must freely become what it will. Time is no longer enslaved by spatial conventions of creating physical significances. Space is devoted to cause and effect paradigm. Time is free of it because it is carried by no cause and effect agent. One reason why we continue to hopelessly imagine that cause and effect will save us. The truth is that quite unexpectedly, time takes or does not take its toll. It saves when things point to an end. It destroys when things appear imperishable. combined personal reminiscence, a whole perspective as it emerged, his own work and what money meant to him. So it's a very, very interesting memory lecture. Now, if you have any questions or any comments, you're free to do that. I hope there's a kind of, uh, there's a, uh, is there someone with, with, with a mic? Sound editing. So uh, we are. Uh, it's evident that we, uh, the uh, audio narration will be perfect. But how do you define in that case a visual narration? he meant was that that was the conventional way of creating creating these qualities of attention as you would often call a shot as a unit of attention so when you take a shot you you don't only record information you are recording the passage of time also I think money before that was painting a lot. And that the abstract painting that he was making was also making him question a lot of conventions about cinema. So he had reached a stage where perhaps he did not, he wanted to be surprised by the art. His whole thing, thinking was that if you see and arrive at a cut, then it's of course a long expected lines and your training your and your understanding of the medium will dictate that way of working but if you were to make a blind cut it's rather a question of accepting than doing and perhaps there is something beautiful in accepting which technically might be wrong During your lecture, you just said that when you were studying at FBI, you never cared about the meaning of the story that uh, the film uh, that was being shown to you. Uh, after making two films of your own, do you still not care about the story or the meaning? No, nobody will give me money if I told them that I don't care. So, 
Yes, I mean, you know, the, 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 the story is the starting point. You know. and, and I'm sure for all the films I saw and I did care about, I'm sure for those directors also the story was the starting point. <coughs> but then I think what, what all filmmakers are after is basically their own way of creating montage, telling, and telling stories. What I perhaps meant was that I was, I was very, uh, I was happy enough to just absorb the, the, the passing time as an abstract experience. And I would not, sometimes not even care to read the subtitles, you know, the we were watching were in foreign languages. And, uh, and somehow not understanding kept me more immersed, you know. So till today I have this habit, I can sit and watch a film without subtitles. And, uh, in any language I would understand. Uh, because of course the film has its own grammar. I will not say grammar. It, I mean, grammar has a certain syntax and it has a certain way of being used. But the uh, film has its own conventions. And, uh, and What's more important is to see how conventions are being deployed or being subverted. And uh, the abstract impressions of images, sounds, movement, words, was perhaps a better way of learning filmmaking, you know, rather than looking at the logical cause and effect of how the story is being plot and, you know. I never read a book about script writing <laughs> or read anything about uh, character development or about uh, psychology. I mean, yes, but but, uh, uh, but not like, you know, till today my way of work, the two films I have made, I have, I have never had an idea of what the character would be like. Till I cast somebody and then that person becomes my character. There is no, there is no kind of, you know, uh, like in conventional script writing, you know, they make you think so much about the character, disposition and past and intentions and whatnot, you know. And uh, I said, you know, when, when we eventually have to be living, being in flesh and blood in front of the camera, you know, I should uh, be worried about that person, why should I have to like write with you? So, uh, yeah, so, I mean, certain films like, you know, like, I remember, you know, like, so I think consciously I never bothered you know, because I was so immersed in the beauty of the images and what was happening and that uh, the narrative thread I never followed and which I had, which I recently did. I saw Balthazar again a few months back just to figure out for myself what the story is and I was like, okay. <laughs> but I felt, you know, I didn't gain anything by knowing the story. You know, the film was equally beautiful for me and I didn't understand the story of Balthazar. So it's, 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 yeah, so just, uh, I am reminded of two or three things. One, that Mani was a Drupal musician and he had learned it and he was teaching Drupal. So he had a very deep grounding in classical music. And if you recall, you can't say such and such rag, what does it mean? It doesn't mean a thing. Uh, if, you, if you want to understand it in the given terms of meaning, one. Second is, I happen to be producer of one of his early films called Satay Surta Atmi, which was on Mukti Bodh started as a film on Mukti Bodh, everybody thought it's going to be a, a kind of a documentary on Mukti Bodh. But it turned out to be a film, and in which the sequences, you could not make out what's happening, uh, in the, in the, again, in the usual uh, terms, conventional terms, because how he uh, joined the things was quite surprising and he, uh, you know, I used to think myself to be a great authority on Mukti Bodh till then and until I met uh, Mani 
and from the airport to my house, uh, he talked about uh, stories uh, of Mukti Bodh, which I had never uh, came to my attention. And then when he made the film, we had, in fact, Money never used to watch his own films, and he would run away, in fact, most of the times. And this film, which is shown in Triveni Kalasangam, there was almost a riot, because all the leftists who thought they owned Mukti Bodh were very enraged by this film, because they couldn't make out uh, anything uh, which they thought was going to be. You see, the point is that when you see a film or any work of art, we tend to forget that we impose on it by way of expectation what we think is the, is the meaning or whatever it is. So we tend to impose it by saying, no, no, I'm willing to accept anything, but I must understand. As if understanding is such a simple, unprejudiced thing. Uh, understanding itself is a very loaded uh, what you understand, what you don't understand. I mean, what do you say that you don't understand Raj Bihagra? What would that mean? It would mean nothing. Because Raj Bihagra, in that sense, doesn't mean anything. Uh, one way of looking at uh, that would be. And the third was he wrote an article on the miniature painting, uh, which we published. I uh, just started a journal in English called Bhagavachan from Bharat Bhavan, and Mani gave this article. It was seen from nowhere. Now his point was that a miniature painting has many elements, many sections, if you like, and their relationship with each other is completely disproportionate. You can't see this kind of a landscape or whatever it is, uh, what you call the painting, from anywhere. You will have to have a changing perspective if you like the perspective so much. So that what is being shown, the Radha and Krishna and the and the tree and the and the lightning and the clouds and the sky and the earth and the temple or, or a palace, they all have different proportions and they cannot be brought in together by a single perspective. So that he said, seen from nowhere. Now, I think these are very instructive, incidentally, but Mani also made films on literary works, like he has. Uh, he made this film on Mukti Bodh, he made a film on Vinod Kumar Shukla, Makaki Kameez, he made a film on Dostoevsky, no? The idiot. Uh, uh, idiot? Uh, yeah. Uh, so there were uh, literary works which he made films on, and uh, it is not as if uh, he completely. Uh, he, but but the kind of uh, cinema he did on these already pre-existing important works. Mohan Rakesh, his first film was on Uski Roti. And you know, there's this famous. Uh, episode that he used to narrate with great relish. That he had a relative called Rajkumar, or what was the name of the actor? Right. Yeah. So Rajkumar uh, ran into him and he said, Mani, I understand uh, you made a film called Uski Roti. So he said, Yes, yes, Uski Roti. Kya Uski Roti? Hum log apna halwa Uski Roti kya banana? Etc. So, you know, there was this. this uh, uh, and Mani started writing poetry. Uh, it was the end of his life. He was writing haikus, very short uh, sort of things. Uh, again, if you remember, a haiku has a single focused image or an idea. It has no context in that sense. The context is within the image. The context is within the idea. There is no larger context in which it exists. So all these things, if you put together, Mani Kaal was a very complex phenomena. And we have yet to grapple with the meaning of Mani Kaal. We are realizing the significance of 
what he called. But was there a meaning? One doesn't know. I think he was a kind of a rag in Indian cinema, which had no meaning and which shunned the meaning, but which inspired so many other people. He said something in a Vedakash picture. Yeah, I will have to yeah, yeah. say it because, uh, and that is kind of, you know, if you can understand, you can say like the statement of what cinema is. So he said, yes, yeah, so we asked this question, what is cinema? He says that we know that cinema is painterly. We know that cinema is musical. We know that cinema is literary. We know that cinema is poetic. So he said, let's keep all these things out in what remains is cinema. <laughs> <laughs> so, now... You want to say something? Yes, I have a question. Yes, sir. Take the mic. So my question is, uh, how did uh, Manikal decide the, the first scene of his film and the last scene? Uh, in a sense, any of the, the films that he's made, one of, I think uh, one of the most important things for any filmmaker is what is the first scene, uh, how is he going to start the film and how the film is going to end. So uh, how did he decide that this is going to be the first scene of the film and this is how the film is going to end? I never worked on a film with him, so I wouldn't know that. But, uh, but one thing he told me, you know, so uh, he said one thing, you know, that since you're talking about the beginning, he said one thing which uh, remains with me. He said that I take every shot as if it's the first shot of the film. And he says, then you can use that shot anywhere. <laughs> if it has that quality of being the first shot. So what he was perhaps saying was that, you know, it's is that the shot is mobile in that way. It is, uh, it can be put. He never felt, I mean, his all struggle was that he should, the shot should not be taken for a particular position in the film. And it should be flexible to be moved around. And perhaps the quality of attention which leads into the shot should be such that you could f that you start afresh with that shot in the middle of the film. And if every shot had that quality, it would be like moving from one fresh shot to another fresh shot to another fresh shot, and then let the create and let that create a sense of uh, wonder and relationship and then and then and so it's not about a fixed relationship which if it, the relationship is not there on the screen. He would he would always talk about how the audience should find their own relationship with the images. Because memory is not singular, memory is not objective. What seeing is not objective. What you are seeing the other person is not seeing. And you are creating your own association with the memory in while watching a work. So the reception of a work is not the same. Thank you so much for uh, one of the most interesting lectures that I have ever attended. Mm -hmm. I love photography. Just wanted to ask you, what do you compose for? Compose for? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> right now I'm stuck with that. <laughs> comes, or when a shot comes, now I am trying to 
fight that impulse so that people don't know to the language. So, but I'm trying, I don't know how I'm doing that, but I'm trying to reach there. <laughs> such a bad thing. <laughs> I mean, you have to be yourself and uh, uh, can't possibly be changing all the time. Uh, that's a notion which has come to us uh, from um, elsewhere. Um, so I don't think that's... A, anyway, uh, all good things must come to an end. So now uh, this evening also comes to an end. But before we do so, uh, let me let you know that we have the next Kedu Charan Mahapatma Memorial Lecture by Kumutni Lakhya, the well-known Kathak dancer and guru, on the 10th of August in the same hall. Uh, and on the 10th of September, we have the Dayakrishna Memorial Lecture by Ram Chandra Guha, on eight threats to freedom of expression. So please do come, all of you, and tell your friends that how interesting these talks are. And if they're not there, they're missing a lot. Or on the on the 19th of July, that is 10 days from now, we have we are running this, you know, we run two series, one here of the Memorial Lectures in collaboration with the India Habitat Center and the other in the India International Center in, with their collaboration called Art Matters. So on the 19th of July, there is a conversation with Amitabh Das, the painter, and the people who will be talking to him is Jogain Chaudhary and Rubina Tagore, an art critic and an artist. This is on the 19th of July. And 
630 at IFC main, uh, what is it called? Tamla Devi Multipurpose Hall on the first floor. Seminar room. And then on the 17th of August, I'm not going to let you rest, my dear. On 17th of August, we have another session of Art Matters at the same place in the Indian International Center, a conversation with Shubha Mudgal, the musician, and S. Kalidas will be talking to her. Uh, these are very interesting conversations, and so you're most welcome, and thank you, Dhrubindra Singh. Uh, your first lecture was rather well prepared. <laughs>